Let's bring in Dr. Anita Ogden. She's an internal medicine specialist and immunologist. Uh, so, Dr. Ogden, the UK has become the first country to approve mass vaccinations with this Pfizer drug. Um, how was Britain able to get ahead of the U.S. on a vaccine co-developed by an American pharmaceutical giant? I realize that it's only, you know, a couple of days ahead of us, but what might the U.S. be able to learn from the U.K.'s timeline? Well, good morning. And I think it's a really exciting day. It's the beginning of a worldwide vaccination program that's really unprecedented in modern medicine. Um, the UK was a little bit uh, more quick because the FDA sort of examines data differently. It looks at raw data uh, and does its own analysis, whereas the UK relies on the, the data provided by the company itself. So that uh, keeps the FDA just a few, few days behind. Um, we're, we're expecting to hear the same thing from, um, you know, the United States around about the Pfizer vaccine uh, next week, around December 10th. Um, but what we could learn is uh, we can start seeing in real time how the vaccine Vaccine rolls out in the UK, um, like the United States. Um, uh, the panel yesterday decided that the uh, the people who should be getting the vaccine first are uh, people in long-term care facilities, uh, nursing homes, and those essential health care workers. Uh, so the United Kingdom feels the same way, and they're going to start rolling it out. So it'll be interesting uh, to see how it plays out for them with the cold chain. Um, also, getting those two doses, um, how are they going to really roll out this vaccine to hospitals? They're already setting up uh, vaccination centers. Uh, what I think will be really important is the reporting of side effects. Uh, as more and more people get the vaccine, uh, there's been such a sort of global lens on uh, the pandemic that the minute somebody has, you know, new side effects or different side effects or more side effects, it's going to be reported in the news. How are we going to handle that? So I think it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out for them first. So, as you know, the Pfizer vaccine uh, has to be transported at negative 94 degrees Fahrenheit. An advisory committee in Britain had given nursing home residents top priority to get vaccinated, but efforts to ensure that the vaccines actually remain cold may uh, mean that the National Health Service staff will actually receive the first shots instead. Can you kind of explain the challenges? Yeah, no, and I think that's a really important point. While those nursing home residents might be at a greater risk for death from the coronavirus, uh, it's really important that the people that are handling uh, those cold chain suitcases and bringing them to the nursing homes aren't infected. Um, so that's going to be the big challenge in terms of the, the different levels of transport involved here and the many people that are involved and how, you know, what we see, they're essentially essential workers within the healthcare system, even in the United States. It does make Make sense that they should get vaccinated first uh, so that they can be protected as well along this sort of global transport. Dr. Ogden, as you know, in the U.S., an advisory panel for the CDC voted yesterday to recommend that residents and employees of nursing homes and similar facilities be the first to receive vaccines as well as health care workers. What will you be monitoring after those first doses are administered? Um, you know, I want to temper this exciting news because we're still in what many doctors, including yourself, have said it's a very dangerous period for uh, those of us here in the United States as infections are rising. Um, and the fact that we haven't really talked about a distribution plan. I mean, I don't think the United States or any country has really undertaken a distribution of a vaccine at this level going back many, many, many years uh, when we had, you know, fewer people in this country. So given that you have to have two doses in some cases of some of those vaccines, how's this going to work? No, I think it's a very, very challenging landscape ahead of us. And I think you raised such a good point. We're about to start a vaccination program in a healthcare system that is already stressed. Uh, one of the first people in that 1A group, as you just mentioned, are healthcare workers and doctors and the many people who work on the front line in a hospital. Well, we already see that these hospitals are incredibly stretched by the pandemic and are reaching capacity. So where are those vaccinations going to happen? Uh, I read an interesting article that also talks about the side effects. We know that these side effects, um, you know, while they're short-lived, uh, but they can lead to fever, muscle aches, um, you know, like malaise. These, these only last a few days, but they're there. So hospitals may have to start thinking about vaccinating doctors in waves so that, you know, people may need time off, which seems like impossible at this point when we're hearing these stories, especially in rural communities, when, you know, there, there are fewer doctors and one or two doctors being absent means 
a lot of stress on on that that particular community. Um, I think these are important things to think about. Also, the two doses, as you said, how are we going to track? You know, we're approaching winter. People might get a vaccine in New York City and then you know go to a second home or something. I mean, unlikely during the pandemic, frankly, and we hope people aren't doing that. But um, what kind of tracking system is in place? So this is really going to be in the hands of the states at this point. Um, and, and the CDC and the FDA are hoping that, you know, the states will follow typical vaccination distribution lines, which they you know, may have used in the past. But I think this is just an incredibly different vaccine in terms of the cold chain and the two doses and having to give it to so many people, um, you know, so quickly because of the pandemic. Uh, I think you're right. We still don't have sort of guidelines or a strategy about how that's going to play out nationally. And so it is going to fall to a state level. Um, so CBS News is also learning that the CDC is considering publishing new guidance soon that would reduce the quarantine guidelines for people exposed to the coronavirus from 14 days to 7 to 10 days. Um, if you test negative, they say 7 days fine if you haven't gotten a test in 10 days. Um, uh, the CDC says this reduction would be data driven. Do you have any concerns? You know, I think this is a really significant update to the CDC guidelines because we are seeing that if you're exposed to uh, somebody who tested positive or has COVID, uh, the, you know, that, that the days to develop infection are really around five days. Uh, so, you know, at this point, we know that if you're at school or you're at work and you've been told that you've been exposed, you have to quarantine for 14 days. I mean, not ideal. So now, as you mentioned, uh, the reduction to seven days with a negative test or 10 days with no test, um, I think it's really encouraging. I think people will become more compliant. Uh, with quarantines uh, and more reliable. And that can really maybe have some effect on controlling numbers of the pandemics. Of course, you know, part of that, what we said, the seven days is uh, dependent on testing, which is still inefficient and not ideal in this country, people waiting for days for their tests. So that's sort of a kink in all of this. But um, I, I think it's good news. And I hope that they, they add that uh, update to their guidelines or website um, shortly. All right, Dr. Anita Ogden, thank you so much. Thank you.